Hello and welcome back to another video and this one will be covering my take on Putin's sanitary zone operation as he called it during his victory speech after his re-election. First off we'll explain the sanitary zone, what it means and what it is and what the purpose of it is. Then we'll move on to the three different stages there is in this operation. And finally, the three different tiers of targets there is in this operation. So first off, what is the sanitary zone that a lot of people are really talking about over the past few days, ever since Putin's victory speech? The sanitary zone that he referred to in his speech is expanding the zone of the control of the Russian army in Ukraine to a point at which the distance between the Russian border with the Ukrainian positions exceeds that of the range of Ukrainian artillery. Now, there are three different ranges that we have to take a look at. The first one is the minimum range, which is, which is the range of howitzers. The M777, for example, has a range of about 30 kilometers. So if we take a zoom into the direction between Bulgarat and Kharkiv, the howitzers would have a 30 kilometer range. So at any given point, the Russians could be shot at from positions near Kharkiv on regions or villages close to the Bulgarat region within Russia. So with this, the Russians need a 30 kilometer zone from the border and outwards. And that would be inside of Kharkiv from the Belgorod region. As such, the Russians would be forced to start or restart the attacks towards Kharkiv to safeguard the Belgorod region. The same with the Kursk region. We have the city of Sumy within 30 kilometers of the border area. So at, at the very start, in the very first stage for this minimal sort of success in this operation about the sanitary zone is to clear 30 kilometers of the border to remove any potential shelling of the classic howitzer systems from the border area. The second range we have to take a look at is the high mass range or generally the MLRS range, which is about 70 to 80 kilometers. We take 80 kilometers as the standard rate that is way beyond the frontline cities of Kharkiv and Sumy. And we even have to take a look at the Kursk region or Bryansk region down to Chernihiv. That is the range at which these MLRS strikes can happen from. So the Russians in this scenario would have or would be forced to attack not just the cities of Sumy, Kharkiv and others, but also towards Chernihiv here in the north. This would mean that the Russians would have to launch an offensive operation through all of the Russian regions bordering Ukraine to attack the frontline cities on the Ukrainian side to prevent or create this zone where the Ukrainians would be unable to strike at Russian territory. So the first stage would be clearing the frontline cities from the shortest range, which is 30 kilometers. The second stage is cleaning the cities within 80 kilometers. And then the third stage is storm shadow missiles, attack and missiles that is between 200 to 400 kilometers range. The 400 kilometers from the front line that is way beyond the Dnieper River. With that, we can see that the Russians would be forced to, if they want to completely clear any sort of strikes into Russian territory, to pretty much capture all of Ukraine. However, we also have to take into consideration how these missiles are launched. The attack and missiles with about 200 kilometers range would be launched from MLRS strikes, the HIMARS system, and that is within the Dnieper River area. This is why the second stage, which includes the area for the attack and HIMARS strikes, is the second stage, and that is everything east of the Dnieper River. The third stage is the one here to the south that is not just safeguarding against the long range weaponry such as attack and storm shadow missiles, but also safeguarding the Black Sea 
against Ukrainian strikes on Russian ships, the Russian Black Sea Navy, and Crimea. The distance between Crimea to southern regions such as Odessa and Mykolaiv is somewhere around the 200 kilometer mark. Now, why I mention how these missiles are launched? Because the ones with 400 kilometer range, the Storm Shadow missiles, are launched from jets, they are launched from planes. And this can be dealt with by the Russians by using their own Russian Air Force and also air defense systems. So they do not need to cover the 400 kilometer range because they can set air defense systems and other systems closer to the front, which would prevent the Ukrainians from getting close enough to the border area. If the Russian air defense system, for example, the S-300 has a range of about 150 kilometers. If the Russians capture the first and second stages, then they can place an S-300 system about around Poltava, for example, and 150 kilometers away, that is somewhere around this area right here, on the west of the Dnieper River. If that is the closest the Ukrainian jets can fly, that is approximately 300 kilometers from Belgorod, so that will still be within range. However, if the Russians also take control over the southern parts of Odessa, Mykolaiv, and etc., then they could place these air defense systems much closer, somewhere around Krivenik or other areas, which would allow the Ukrainians, which would allow the Russians to prevent the Ukrainians from launching any missiles into Russia, as the range would simply be above 400 kilometers. Could also place it in areas here to the north, 150 kilometers away, and that would make it very difficult for the Ukrainians to launch missiles into Russian regions. They could launch into the Bryansk and Kursk regions. However, this would be over an area with Russian air defense active before reaching Russian territory. And as such, the Russians can shoot down these missiles prior to them hitting their targets deep within Russian territory. So the whole idea of this is simply to safeguard Russian territory from Ukrainian strikes. That is the idea of this campaign. So now that you understand why the three stages are set up in three different stages, direct artillery fire, HIMARS and mid to long range missile strikes, and long range missile strikes and sea based missile strikes in these three different stages. We can also cover it with the tactical and strategic positioning of these villages and cities, as I have pointed out in the different tiers. I've made three different tiers for different cities. Tier one is for targets that the Russians have with a major offensive. If they do not capture these tier one cities, the offensive would be a major disaster and a failure for the Russians. So these tier one cities are the minimal covering or minimal targets that the Russians need to capture to be able to cause this offensive as some sort of Peric victory. The tier one cities or areas is the Krematorsk, Konstantinivka line, Pokrovsk and Isium. Basically the Donetsk region and Isium. As for the tier two targets, these are targets that the Russians would have an interest in capturing. But even if they fail at capturing every single one of these, they can still call it a Peric victory because they would have taken control over the Donetsk region. However, they are all high priority targets for the Russians and would likely not stop the offensive operations until they have taken at least a couple of them. These targets are the Kharkiv city, the city of Sumy, Pultava and Chernihiv, as well as Saporizhia. The targets here by the Russians would be to launch an offensive in the direction of these cities, Kharkiv, Sumy and Chernihiv from the east. As for Poltava, that would be by sieging the two cities of Kharkiv and Sumy and bypassing it, going straight to Poltava to cut off the supplies and assault from the south towards Saporizhia to cut off the supplies there as well, while storming the cities and areas in the tier one zone. The tier three cities are cities that are also high priority targets, targets that would secure a strong and fatal victory on the Ukrainian side. 
However, the difference between the tier two and tier three cities is that if the Russians gain control over these tier three cities, it is very likely that the Ukrainians simply capitulate from the pressure. If the Russians cross the Dnieper River and start sieging the cities of Mykolaiv and Odessa and gain control of these cities, the Ukrainian army would have collapsed at that point. If the Russians gain control over every single one of the cities by the Dnieper River, the Ukrainians would have no hope of ever regaining territory east of the Dnieper River. So these tier 3 cities are game-breaking cities. They are cities that the Russians would only control if they, at the point, simply made the Ukrainian army collapse. While the tier 2 cities are cities that they can take control of, that they can capture, yet the Ukrainians would still have the ability to continue the fight and continue resisting the Russians. Putin announced in his victory speech that he would have to do this operation that he calls creating a sanitary zone. However, something to note is that the Russians can simply stop at any of these points. They could stop at the first stage and claim they have created this sanitary zone, Belgorod is safe, there's no reason to continue, and they can simply continue the battle of attrition there. They could also stop at the second stage, claiming the Dnieper River is captured, they do not need to go further. Or they could simply wait until they go through the third stage, and they will claim complete victory over Ukraine. The Russians in this case, which Putin has announced they, they will do this, they will launch this control over the sanitary or creating a sanitary zone west of Belgorod, west of the Russian territories to safeguard these cities from Ukrainian incursions and Ukrainian shelling. So this will happen. The Russians are currently preparing for this by creating additional supply lines, by creating railways, creating additional supplies and logistical or breaking logistical bottlenecks throughout the front to allow them to concentrate larger amounts of forces and more equipment by the front line to allow them to launch larger offensives. They're also improving coordination by getting new gear that allows better coordination by training the coordination and larger maneuvers. So all of this is taking place as the Russians prepare. They're also building up ammunition. They're building up the missile stockpile. They're building up everything that they need for a large offensive. And everything points towards them being ready very, very soon. While the Ukrainians are preparing for this by building lines of defense. They're building next to Kharkiv and Sumy. They're building in the north. They're building in the south. They're even building lines of defense near Odessa. The Ukrainians are planning on defending every single inch of the territory that is being marked out. This is where all of the fortifications are being focused, in between Kiev, Odessa and Kharkiv. This triangle of defense is exactly where all of the fortifications are being built. There's also lines near the front line, but that is obvious as it is near the front line. There's also fortifications in the north and to, through to the Sumy region. So these are the areas where all of the Ukrainian fortifications are being built right now. The longer time it takes before the Russians start the operation, the more prepared the Ukrainians will be. And we saw how that happened with the Ukrainian summer offensive. They waited for half a year before they actually launched the offensive, which allowed the Russians to build the sort of vacant line. Now we'll see if the Russians will continue delaying it until the summer, or if they will launch it as soon as they are ready. But it is likely that it may not wait until the summer for the Russians to launch this offensive, but it could happen earlier if they are ready earlier. But it is very unlikely that they'll launch the offensive operation before they feel like they are 100% ready, and that is having a large enough stockpile of ammunition, missiles, tanks, equipment, etc. And at the same time that their coordination is on par and all of the logistical bottlenecks are broken. And at that point, we'll likely see a large-scale offensive by the Russians, where they'll be attacking the cities of Sumy and Kharkiv to the east, the city of Zaporizhia to the south, a full-scale assault in the Donetsk region to capture the Donetsk region and Liman plus Izium, after which they'll start launching operations in the north towards Chernihiv and push westwards towards Poltava and the Dnieper River, before finally attempting to cross over the Dnieper River to control 
the southern region of Ukraine towards Odessa and Mykolaiv, while also starting a siege towards Kiev to redirect Ukrainian forces to the north from the south and at the same time to force the Ukrainians to negotiate with a complete capitulation or collapse of the Ukrainian government. What I'm saying is that this summer offensive or this upcoming Russian offensive has the potential to end this war this year or early next year, but there's also a very high possibility that it does not succeed or has limited success. Depending on the success, level of success that the Russians experience in this war or in this offensive, the Russians may end the war this year, the next year, or it may return to a battle of attrition. But that is all I have for this scenario. That's going to be all for this video. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.